Chapter One of The Hound from the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. The Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum. Chapter One In the Mountains. A pallid sun, low, gleaming just over a rampart of mountain tops, sun dogs, heralds of stormy weather, fiercely staring, like sentries, upon either hand of the mighty sphere of light, vast glaciers shimmering jewel like in the steely light of the semi arctic evening, black belts of gloomy pine woods on the lower slopes of the mountains, the trees snow burdened, but black with the darkness of night in their melancholy depths, the earth white snow to the thickness of many feet on all life none not a beast of the earth nor a fowl of the air nor the hum of an insect solitude cold grey pitiless cold night is approaching the hill ranges which backbone the american continent the northern extremity of the rocky mountains the barrier which confronts the traveller as he journeys from the yukon valley to the alaskan seaboard land where the foot of man but rarely treads and midwinter but now in the dying light of day a man comes slowly painfully into the picture what an atom in that infinity of awful grandeur one little life in all that desert of snow and ice and what a life the poor wretch was swathed in furs, snowshoes on his feet, and a long staff lent his drooping figure support. His whole attitude told its own tale of exhaustion. But a closer inspection, one glance into the fierce burning eyes, which glowered from the depths of two cavernous sockets, would have added a sequel of starvation. The eyes had a frenzied look in them, the look of a man without hope but with still that instinct of life burning in his brain. Every now and again he raised one mitted hand and pressed it to his nose and cheeks. He knew his face was frozen, but he had no desire to stop to thaw it out. He was beyond such trifles. His upturned storm-collar had become massed with icicles about his mouth, and the fur was frozen solidly to his chin-whiskers, but he gave the matter no heed. The man tottered on, still onward, with the dogged persistence which the inborn love of life inspires. He longed to rest, to seat himself upon the snow just where he happened to be, to indulge that craving for sleep which was upon him. His state of exhaustion fostered these feelings, and only his brain fought for him and clung to life. He knew what that drowsy sensation meant. He was slowly freezing. To rest meant sleep. To sleep meant death. Slowly he dragged himself up the inclining ledge he was traversing. The path was low at the base of one of the loftiest crags. It wound its way upwards in such a fashion that he could see little more than fifty yards ahead of him ere it turned away to the left as it skirted the hill. He was using his last reserve of strength, and he knew it. At the top he stood half-dazed, the mountain rose sheer up to dizzy heights on one side and a precipice was on the other he turned his dreadful eyes this way and that then he scanned the prospect before him a haze of dimly outlined mountains he glanced back tracing his uneven tracks until they disappeared in the grey evening light then he turned back again to a contemplation of what lay before him Suddenly his staff slipped from his hand as though he no longer had the strength to grip it. Then, raising his arms aloft, he gave vent to one despairing cry in which was expressed all the pent-up agony of his soul. It was the cry of one from whom all hope had gone. "'God! God! Have mercy on me! I am lost! Lost!' The despairing note echoed and re-echoed among the hills, and as each echo came back to his dulled ears, it was as though some invisible being mocked him. Suddenly he braced himself, and his mind obtained a momentary triumph over his physical weakness. He stooped to recover his staff. His limbs refused to obey his will. He stumbled. Then he crumpled and fell in a heap upon the snow. 
all was silent and he lay quite still death was gripping him and he knew it presently he wearily raised his head he gazed about him with eyelids more than half closed is it worth the struggle he seemed to ask is there any hope he felt so warm so comfortable out there in the bitter winter air where had been the use of his efforts where the use of the gold he had so laboriously collected at the new el dorado at the thought of his gold his spirit tried to rouse him from the sleep with which he was threatened his eyelids opened wide and his eyes from which intelligence was fast disappearing rolled in their gaunt sockets his body heaved as though he were about to rise but beyond that he did not move as he lay there a sound reached his numbed ears clear through the crisp night air it came with the keenness and piercing incision which is only obtained in the still air of such latitudes it was a human cry a long-drawn whoop like his own cry it echoed amongst the hills it only needed such as this to support the inclinations of the sufferer's will his head was again raised and in his wild eyes was a look of alertness hope he listened he counted the echoes as they came then with an almost superhuman effort he struggled to his feet new life had come to him born of hope his weakened frame answered to his great effort his heart was throbbing wildly as he stood up the cry came to him again nearer this time he moved forward and rounded the bend in the path again the cry now just ahead of him he answered it with joy in his tone and shambled on now two dark figures loomed up in the grey twilight they were moving swiftly along the ledge towards him they cried out something in a foreign tongue he did not understand but his joy was no less they came up and he saw before him the short stout figures of two fur-clad eskimos he was saved inside a small dugout a dingy oil lamp shed its murky rays upon squalid surroundings the place was reeking with the offensive odours exhaled from the burning oil the atmosphere was stifling there were four occupants of this abode and stretched in various attitudes on dusty blankets spread upon the ground they presented a strange picture two of these were eskimos the broad flat faces sharp noses and heavy lips were unmistakable as were their dusky greasy skins and squat figures a third man was something between the white man and the redskin he was in the nature of a half-breed and though not exactly pleasant to look upon he was certainly interesting as a study he was lying with limbs outstretched and his head propped upon one hand while his gaze was directed with thoughtful intensity towards a small fierce burning camp stove which at that moment was rendering the hut so unbearably hot his face was sallow and indented with smallpox scars. He had no hair upon it, except a tuft or two of eyebrows, which the ravages of disease had condescended to leave to him. His nose, which was his best feature, was beaky, but beautifully aquiline. But his mouth was wide, with a lower lip that sagged loosely from its fellow above. His head was small, and was burdened with a crown of lank black hair, which had been allowed to grow Indian-like, until it hung upon his shoulders." He was of medium height, and his arms were of undue length. The other occupant of the dugout was our traveller. He was stretched upon a blanket, on which was spread his fur coat, and he was alternating between the disposal of a bowl of steaming soup and groaning with the racking pains caused by his recently thawed-out frostbites. The soup warmed his starving body, and his pain increased proportionately. In spite of the latter, however, he felt very much alive. Occasionally he glanced round upon his silent companions. Whenever he did so, one or the other, or both of the Eskimos, were gazing stolidly at him. He was rather a good-looking man, notwithstanding his now unkempt appearance. His eyes were large, very large, in their hollow sockets. His nose and cheeks were, at present, a mass of blisters from the thawing frostbites, and his mouth and chin were hidden behind a curtain of whiskers of about three weeks' growth. There was no mistaking him for anything but an Anglo-Saxon, and a man of considerable and very fine proportions. When his soup was finished he set the bowl down and leaned back with a sigh. The pockmarked man glanced over at him. "'More?' he said in a deep, 
not unmusical tone. The half-starved traveller nodded, and his eyes sparkled. One of the Eskimos rose and refilled the bowl from a tin camp kettle, which stood on the stove. The famished man took it, and at once began to sup the invigorating liquid. The agonies of his frostbites were terrible, but the pangs of hunger were greater. By and by the bowl was set down, empty. The half-breed sat up and crossed his legs, and leant his back against two sacks which contained something that crackled slightly under his weight. "'Give you something more solid in an hour or so. Best not to have it too soon,' he said, speaking slowly, but with good enunciation. "'Not now,' said the traveller in a disappointed tone. The other shook his head. "'We're all going to have supper, then. Best wait.' Then, after a pause, "'Where from?' Forty Mile Creek, said the other. You don't say. Alone? There was a curious saving of words in this man's mode of speech. Possibly he had learned this method from his Indian associates. The traveller nodded. Yes. Where to? The sea coast. The half-breed laughed gutturally. Forty Mile Creek? Sea coast? On foot? Alone? Winter? You must be mad. The traveller shook his head. Not mad. I could have done it, only I lost my way. I had all my stages thought out carefully. I tramped from the sea coast originally. Where am I now? The half-breed eyed the speaker curiously. He seemed to think well before he answered, then, Within a few miles of the pass, to the north. An impressive silence followed. The half-breed continued to eye the sick man, and to judge from the expression of his face, his thoughts were not altogether unpleasant. He watched the weary face before him until the eyes gradually closed, and in spite of the burning pains of the frost-bites, exhaustion did its work, and the man slept. He waited for some moments, listening to the heavy, regular breathing. Then he turned to his companions and spoke long and earnestly, in a curious tongue, one of the Eskimos rose and removed a piece of bacon from a nail in the wall. This he placed in the camp kettle on the stove. Then he took a tin billy and dipped it full from a bucket containing beans that had been set to soak. These also went into the camp kettle. Then the fellow threw himself down again upon his blankets, and for some time the three men continued to converse in low tones. They glanced frequently at the sleeper, and occasionally gurgled out a curious throaty chuckle. Their whole attitude was furtive, and the man slept on. An hour passed. Two. The third was more than half gone. The hut reeked with the smell of cooking victuals. The Eskimo, who seemed to act as cook, occasionally looked into the camp kettle. The other two were lying on their blankets, sometimes conversing, but more often silent, gazing stolidly before them. At length the cook uttered a sharp ejaculation and lifted the steaming kettle from its place on the stove. Then he produced four deep pannikins from a sack and four greasy-looking spoons. From another he produced a pile of biscuits, hardtack, well known on the northern trails. Supper was ready, and the pockmarked man leant over and roused the traveller. Food, he said laconically, as the startled sleeper rubbed his eyes. The man sat up and gazed hungrily at the iron pot. The Indian served out the pork with ruthless hands. A knife divided the piece into four, and he placed one in each pannikin. Then he poured the beans and soup over each portion. The biscuits were placed within reach, and the supper was served. The sick man devoured his uncouth food with great relish. The soup which had been first given him had done him much good, and now the solid completed the restoration so opportunely begun. He was a vigorous man, and his exhaustion had chiefly been brought about by lack of food. Now, as he sat with his empty pannikin in front of him, he looked gratefully over at his rescuers, and slowly munched some dry biscuit, and sipped occasionally from a great beaker of black coffee. Life was very sweet to him at that moment, and he thought joyfully of the belt inside his clothes, laden with the golden result of his labours on Forty Mile Creek. Now the half-breed turned to him. "'Feeling pretty good?' he observed, conversationally. "'Yes, thanks to you and your friends. You must let me pay you for this.' The suggestion was coarsely put. Returning strength was restoring the stranger to his usual condition of mind. 
there was little refinement about this man from the Yukon. The other waved the suggestion. Sour belly's pretty good tack when you can't get any better. Been many days on the road? Three weeks. The traveller was conscious of three pairs of eyes fixed upon his face. Hoofing right along? Yes, I missed the trail nearly a week back. Followed the track of a dog train. It came some distance this way. Then I lost it. Ah, food ran out, maybe. The half-breed had now turned away and was gazing at the stove as though it had a great fascination for him. Yes, I meant to make the pass where I could lay in a fresh store. Instead of that I wandered on till I found the empty pack got too heavy. Then I left it. Left it? The half-breed raised his two little tufts of eyebrows, but his eyes remained staring at the stove. Oh, it was empty, clean empty. You see, I didn't trust anything but food in my pack. No, that's so. Maybe gold isn't safe in a pack? The pockmarked face remained turned towards the glowing stove. The man's manner was quite indifferent. It suggested that he merely wished to talk. The traveller seemed to draw back into his shell at the mention of gold. A slight pause followed. Maybe you ain't been digging up there? The half-breed went on presently. It's rotten bad digging on the creek, the traveller said, clumsily endeavouring to evade the question. So I've heard said the half-breed. He had produced a pipe and was leisurely filling it from a pouch of antelope hide. His two companions did the same. The stranger took his pipe from his fur coat pocket and cut some tobacco from a plug. This he offered to his companions, but it was rejected in favour of their own. The only thing I've had, that in my fur coat, to keep me from freezing to death for more than four days. Haven't so much as seen a sign of life since I lost the dog track. This country's a terror, observed the half-breed emphatically. All four men lit their pipes. The sick man only drew once or twice at his. Then he laid it aside. The process of smoking caused the blisters on his face to smart terribly. Gives your face jip, said the half-breed sympathetically. Best not bother to smoke to-night. He pulled vigorously at his own pipe, and the two Indians followed suit and gradually a pleasant odour, not of tobacco but some strange perfume, disguised the reek of the atmosphere. It was pungent but delightful, and the stranger remarked upon it. "'What's that you are smoking?' he asked. For one instant the half-breed's eyes were turned upon him with a curious look. Then he turned back to the contemplation of the stove. "'Kind o' weed that grows round these wilds,' he answered. "'Only stuff we get hereabouts.' "'It's good when you're used to it,' he laughed quietly. The stranger looked from one to the other of his three companions. He was struck by a sudden thought. "'What do you do here, I mean, for a living?' "'Trap,' replied the breed shortly. "'Many furs about?' "'Fair.' "'Slow work,' said the stranger indifferently. Then a silence fell. The wayfarer was getting very drowsy. The pungent odour from his companion's pipes seemed to have a strangely soothing effect upon him. Before he was aware of it he caught himself nodding, and, try as he would, he could not keep his heavy eyelids open. The men smoked on in silence. Three pairs of eyes watched the stranger's efforts to keep awake, and a malicious gleam was in the look with which they surveyed him. He was too sleepy to observe. Besides, had he been in condition to do so, the expression of their eyes would probably have been different. Slowly his head drooped forward. He was dreaming pleasantly already, although as yet he was not quite asleep. Now he no longer attempted to keep his eyes open. Further his head drooped forward. The three men were still as mice. Then suddenly he rolled over on one side, and her stertorous breathing indicated a deep, unnatural slumber. The hut was in darkness, but for a beam of light which made its way in through a narrow slit over the door. The sunlight shone down upon the huddled figure of the traveller, who still slept in the attitude in which he had rolled over on his fur coat, when sleep had first overcome him. Otherwise the hut was empty. The half-breed and his companions had disappeared. The fire was out. 
The lamp had burned itself out. The place was intensely cold. Suddenly the sleeper stirred. He straightened himself out and turned over. Then, without further warning, he sat up and found himself staring up at the dazzling streak of light. Daylight, he murmured, and they've let the stove go out. Gee, but I feel queer about the head. Moving his head so that his eyes should miss the glare of light, he gazed about him. He was alone, and as he realized this, he scrambled to his feet, and, for the moment, the room, everything about him, seemed to be turning topsy-turvy. He placed his hand against the post which supported the roof and steadied himself. "'I wonder where they are,' he muttered. "'Oh, of course,' as an afterthought. "'They are at their traps. They might have stoked the fire. It's perishing in here. I feel beastly queer. Must be the effects of starvation.' Then he moved a step forward. He brought up suddenly to a standstill. His two hands went to his waist. They moved, groping round it spasmodically. Undoing his clothes, he passed his hand into his shirt. Then one word escaped him, one word almost a whisper, but conveying such a world of fierce, horror-stricken intensity. Robbed! And the look which accompanied his exclamation was the look of a man whose mind is distracted. So he stood for some seconds. His lips moved, but no words escaped them. His hand remained within his shirt, and his fingers continued to grope about mechanically, and all the time the dazed, strained look burned in his great, roving eyes. It was gone. The broad belt, weighted down with the result of one year's toil, gold dust and nuggets, was gone. Presently he seated himself on the cold iron stove, Thus he sat for an hour, looking straight before him with eyes that seemed to draw closer together, so intense was their gaze, and who shall say what thoughts he thought, what wild schemes of revenge he planned. There was no outward sign, just those silent, moving lips. End of chapter 1《ハウンドフォーメーションズ・ファミリー・ジャーナル》Chapter Two of The Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum. This is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Two, Mr. Zachary Smith. Rot, man, rot! I've been up here long enough to know my way about this devil's country. No confounded nesh can teach me. The trail forked at that bush we passed three days back. We're all right. I wish I felt as sure about the weather. Leslie Gray broke off abruptly. His tone was resentful as well as dictatorial. He was never what one might call an easy man. He was always headstrong and never failed to resent interference on the smallest provocation. Perhaps these things were in the nature of his calling. He was one of the head customs officials on the Canadian side of the Alaskan boundary. His companion was a subordinate. The latter was a man of medium height, and from the little that could be seen of his face between the high folds of the storm collar of his buffalo coat, he possessed a long nose and a pair of dark, keen, yet merry eyes. His name was Rob Chillingwood. The two men were tramping along on snowshoes in the rear of a dog train. An Indian was keeping pace with the dogs in front. The latter, five in number, harnessed in the usual tandem fashion to a heavily laden sled. "'It's no use anticipating bad weather,' replied Chillingwood, quietly. "'But as to the question of the trail—' "'There's no question,' interrupted Gray sharply. "'Ah, the map shows two clumps of bush. "'The trail turns off at one of them. "'My chart says the second. "'I studied it carefully. "'The confounded Nesh, as you call him, says not yet, "'which means that he considers it to be the second bush. "'You say no.' The Nash only knows the trail by repute. You have never been over it before. I have travelled it six times. You make me tired. Give it a rest. Perhaps you can make something of those nasty, sharp puffs of wind which keep lifting the ground snow at intervals. Rob shrugged his fur-coated shoulders and glanced up at the sun. It seemed to be struggling hard to pierce a grey haze which hung over the mountains. The sun-dogs, too, could be seen, but, like the sun itself, they were dim and glowed rather than shone. That patchy wind, so well known in the west of Canada, was very evident just then. 
it seemed to hit the snow-bound earth slither viciously along the surface sweep up a thin cloud of loose surface snow then drop in an instant but only to operate in the same manner at some other spot this was going on spasmodically in many directions the snow brushing up in hissing eddies at each attack and slowly the grey mist on the hills was obscuring the sun rob chillingwood was a man of some experience on the prairie although as his companion had said he was new to this particular mountain trail to his trained eye the outlook was not encouraging storm he observed shortly that's my opinion said gray definitely according to calculations if we have not gone off the trail chillingwood went on with a sly look at his superior we should reach dougal's roadside hostelry in the pass by eight o'clock well before dark we ought to escape the storm you mean we shall said gray pointedly if bunkum the two men relapsed into silence they were very good friends these two both were used to the strenuous northern winter both understood the dangers of a blizzard their argument about the trail they were on was quite a friendly one it was only the dictatorial manner of leslie gray which gave it the appearance of a quarrel chillingwood understood him and took no notice of his somewhat irascible remarks whilst for himself he remained of opinion that he had read his ordnance chart aright they tramped on each man with a common thought was watching the weather indications as the time passed the wind patches grew in size in force and in frequency of recurrence the haze upon the surrounding hills rapidly deepened and the air was full of frost particles a storm was coming on apace nor was dougal's wayside hostelry within sight it's a rotten life on the boundary said rob as though continuing a thought aloud it's not so much the life replied gray vindictively it's the damned red tape that demands the half yearly journey down country that's the dog's part of our business why can't they establish a branch bank up here for the bullion and send all returns by mail there is a postal service of a kind it's a one-horsed layout government work there'll come a rush to yukon valley this year and when there's a chance of doing something for ourselves having done all we can for the government i suppose they'll shift us it's the way of governments i'm sick of it i draw four thousand dollars a year and i earn every cent of it you draw one thousand and think myself lucky if i taste fresh vegetables once a week during the summer say leslie do you think it's possible to assimilate the humble but useful hog by means of a steady diet of sour belly gray laughed if that were possible i guess we ought to make the primest bacon hello here comes the damned nish what's up now i wonder well rainy moon what is it the indian had stopped his dogs and now turned back to speak to the two men his face was expressionless he was a tall specimen of the cree indian ugh he grunted as he came to a standstill then he stretched out his arm with a wide sweep in the direction of the mountains no good white men coyote yes so he pointed to the south and made a motion of running yes plenty beef plenty fire water white man store his face slowly expanded into a smile then the smile died out suddenly and he turned to the north and made a long swoosh with rising intonation signifying the rising wind him very bad white man sleep sleep wake no and he finished up with a shake of the head then his arm dropped to his side and he waited for gray to speak for a moment the customs officer remained silent chillingwood waited anxiously both men understood the indian's meaning chillingwood believed the man to be right about the trail as to the coming storm and the probable consequences if they were caught in it that was patent to all three but gray with characteristic pig-headedness gave no heed to the superior intelligence of the indian where matters of direction in a wild country were concerned he knew he was on the right trail that was sufficient for him but he surveyed the surrounding mountains well before he spoke they had halted in a sort of cup-like hollow with towering sides surmounted by huge glaciers down which the wind was now whistling with vicious force there were only two exits from this vast arena the one by which the travellers had entered it 
and the other directly ahead of them. The latter was only to be approached by a wide ledge which skirted one of the mountains and inclined sharply upwards. Higher up the mountain slope was a belt of pine woods, close to which was a stubbly growth of low bush. This was curiously black in contrast with the white surroundings, for no snow was upon its weedy branches and shriveled, discoloured leaves. Suddenly, while Grey was looking out beyond the dog train, he observed the impress of snowshoes in the snow. He pointed to them and drew his companion's attention. "'You see,' he said triumphantly, "'there has been someone passing this way just ahead of us. Look here, Nesh, you just get right on and don't let me have any more nonsense about the trail.' The Indian shook his head. Ow, he grunted. This little, just little. Then he pointed ahead. Big white. All white. No, no. White man no come this way. Bimabi nesh so. And Rainy Moon made a motion of lying down and sleeping. He meant that they would get lost and die in the snow. Gray became angry. Get on, he shouted. And Rainy Moon reluctantly turned and started his dogs afresh. The little party ascended the sloping path. The whipping snow lashed their faces as the wind rushed it up from the ground in rapidly thickening clouds. The fierce gusts were concentrating into a steady, shrieking blast. A grey cloud of snow, thin as yet, but plainly perceptible, was in the air. The threat it conveyed was no idle one. The terror of the blizzard was well known to those people and they knew that in a short space they would have to seek what shelter they might chance to find upon these almost barren mountains. The white men tightened the woolen scarves about the storm collars of their coats, and occasionally beat their mitted hands against their sides. The gathering wind was intensifying the cold. "'If this goes on, we shall have to make that belt of pine woods for shelter,' observed Rob Chillingwood practically." It won't do to take chances of losing the dogs and their load in the storm. What say? They had rounded a bend, and Gray was watchfully gazing ahead. He did not seem to hear his companion's question. Suddenly he pointed directly along the path towards a point where it seemed to vanish between two vast crags. Smoke, he said, and his tone conveyed that he wished his companion to understand that he, Gray, had been right about the trail and that Rob had been wrong. "'That's Dougal's store,' he went on, after a slight pause. Chillingwood looked as directed. He saw the rush of smoke which, in the rising storm, was ruthlessly swept from the mouth of a piece of upright stove-pipe, which in the now grey surroundings could just be distinguished. "'But I thought there was a broad open trail at Dougal's,' he said at last, after gazing for some moments at the tiny smokestack. "'Maybe the road opens out here.' answered Gray weakly. But it didn't. Instead, it narrowed, and as they ascended the slope it became more and more precipitous. The storm was now beating up, seemingly from every direction, and it was with difficulty that the five great huskies hauled their burden in the face of it. However, Rainy Moon urged them to their task with no light hand, and just as the storm settled down to its work in right good earnest, they drew up abreast of a small dugout. The path had narrowed down to barely six feet in width, bordered on the left hand by a sharp slope upwards towards the pinewood belt above, and on the right by a sheer precipice, whilst fifty feet further on there was no more path, just space. As this became apparent to him, Rob Chillingwood could not help wondering what their fate might have been had the storm overtaken them earlier and they had not come upon the dugout. However, he had no time for much speculation on the subject, for, as the dogs came to a stand, the door of the dugout was thrown back, and a tall, cadaverous-looking man stood framed in the opening. "'Kind of struck it lucky,' he observed, without any great show of enthusiasm. "'Come right in. The Nesh can take the dogs round the side there,' pointing to the left of the dugout. "'There's a weatherproof shack there where I keep my kindling.' guess he can fix up in that till this damned breeze has blown itself out. You've missed the trail, I take it. Come right in. Half an hour later the two customs officers were seated with their host round the camp stove which stood hissing and spluttering in the centre of the hut. The dogs and Rainy Moon were housed in the woodshed. Now that the travellers were divested of their heavy furs, their appearance was less picturesque, but more presentable. Rob Chillingwood was about twenty-five, 
his whole countenance indexed a sturdy honesty of thought and a merry disposition there was considerable strength too about brow and jaw leslie gray was shorter than his companion a man of dapper sturdy figure and with a face good-looking obstinate and displaying as much sense of humour as a barbed wire fence post he was fully thirty years of age their host possessed a long attenuated but powerful figure and a face chiefly remarkable for its cadaverous hollows and a pair of hungry eyes and a dark chin-whisker yes sir this individual was saying she's gonna howl good and hard for the next forty-eight hours or i don't know these parts maybe you're from the valley chillingwood shook his head no fort cudahay way he said my name's chillingwood rob chillingwood this is mr leslie gray customs officer i am his assistant the long man glanced slowly at his guests his grey eyes seemed to take in the details of each man's appearance with solemn curiosity then he twisted slowly upon the upturned box on which he was seated and crossed his legs i'm pleased to meet you gentlemen it's lonely in these parts lonely he shuddered as though with cold i've been trapping in these latitudes for a considerable period and it's lonely my name is zachary smith as the trapper pronounced his name he glanced keenly from one to the other of the two men beside him his look was suggestive of doubt he seemed to be trying to reassure himself that he had never before crossed the paths of these chance guests of his after a moment of apprehensive silence he went on slowly like one groping in darkness his confidence was not fully established you can make up your minds to a couple of days in this shanty anyhow i mostly live on sour belly and hardtack don't sound inviting eh chillingwood laughed pleasantly we're government officials he said with meaning yes put in gray but we've got plenty of canned truck in our baggage i'm thinking you may find our supplies a pleasant change no doubt no doubt whatever cat's meat would be a delicacy after months of tallowy pork this slow-spoken trapper surveyed his guests thoughtfully the travellers were enjoying the comforting shelter and warmth neither of them seemed particularly talkative presently gray roused himself extreme heat after extreme cold always has a somnolent effect on those who experience it we'd best get the stuff off the sleigh chillingwood said he rainy moons above the average indian for honesty but nevertheless we don't need to take chances and as the younger man rose and stretched himself food is good on occasions what does mr zachary smith say ay let's sample some white man's grub gentlemen this is a fortunate meeting all round chillingwood passed out of the hut as he opened the door a vindictive blast of wind swept a cloud of snow in and the frozen particles fell crackling and hissing upon the glowing stove and they call this a white man's country observed mr smith pensively as the door closed again he opened the stove and proceeded to knock the embers together preparatory to stoking up afresh guess you were making for the pass he said conversationally yes replied gray missed the trail the other said pitching a cordwood stick accurately into the centre of the glowing embers gray made no answer "'Tisn't in the way of governments to show consideration to their servants,' Mr. Smith went on, filling the stove with fuel to the limit of its holding capacity. "'It's a deadly season to be forced to travel about in.' "'Consideration,' said Gray bitterly. "'I'm forced to undertake this journey twice a year, which means I am on the road the best part of my time, and merely because there is no bank or authorized place for depositing—' ah gold put in mr zachary smith quietly and reams of returns they reckon that the rush to the yukon'll come next year maybe things'll alter then smith straightened himself up from his occupation his face displayed but the most ordinary interest in the conversation at that moment chillingwood returned bearing two small brass-bound chests the indian followed him bringing a number of packages of tinned food smith glanced from the chests which were as much as chillingwood could carry to the angular proportions of the indian's burden then back again to the chests he watched furtively as the officer deposited the latter 
Then he turned back to the stove and opened the damper. Then followed a meal of which all three partook with that heartiness which comes of an appetite induced by a hardy open-air life. They talked but little while they ate, and that little was of the prospects of the new Eldorado. Leslie Gray spoke with the bitterness of a disappointed man. In reality, he had been successful in the business he had adopted. But some men are born grumblers, and he was one. It is probable that, had he been born a prince, he would have loudly lamented the fact that he was not a king. Chillingwood was different. He accepted the situation and enjoyed his life. He was unambitious, whilst faithfully doing that which he regarded as his duty, first to himself, then to his employers. His method of life was something like that of the sailor. He fully appreciated the motto of the seafaring gentry, one hand for himself and one for his employers. When in doubt, both hands for self. He meant to break away from his present employment when the Yukon rush came. In the meantime, he was on the spot. Mr. Zachary Smith chiefly listened. He could eat and watch his guests. He could study them, and he seemed in no way inclined to waste his time on words when he could do the other two things. He said little about himself and was mainly contented with comprehensive nods and grunts, whilst he devoured huge portions of tinned tongue and swallowed bumpers of scalding tea. After dinner the travellers produced their pipes. Gray offered his tobacco to their host. Mr. Zachary Smith shook his head. "'Given up tobacco, mostly,' he said, glancing in the direction of the door, which groaned under a sudden attack from the storm which was now howling with terrible force outside. "'It isn't that I don't like it. But when a man gets cooped up in these hills, he's like to run out of it, and then it's uncomfortable. I've taken on a native weed which does me for smoking when I need it, which isn't often.' It grows hereabouts, and isn't likely to give out. Guess I won't smoke now. Gray shrugged and lit his pipe. If any man could be fool enough to reject tobacco, Leslie Gray was not the sort of man to press him. He was intolerant of ideas in any one but himself. Chillingwood sucked luxuriously at his pipe, and thought big things. The blue smoke clouds curled insinuatingly about the heads of the smokers, and rose heavily upon the dense atmosphere of the hut. The two men stretched themselves indolently upon the ground, sometimes speaking, but for the most part silent. These wayfarers thought little of time. They had a certain task to perform which, the elements permitting, they would carry out in due course. In the meantime it was storming, and they had been fortunate in finding shelter in these wastes of snow and ice. They were glad to accept what comfort came their way. This enforced delay would find a simple record in Leslie Gray's report to his superiors. Owing to a heavy storm, etc. They were government servants. The routine of these men's lives was all very monotonous, but they were used to it, and use is a wonderful thing. It so closely borders on content. Cards were produced later on. Mr. Zachary Smith resisted the blandishments of cut-throat euchre, he had no money to spare for gambling, he informed his guests. He would look on. He sat over the stove whilst the others played. Later on the cards were put away, and the travellers, curling themselves into their blankets, composed themselves to sleep. The lean figure sat silently blinking at the red sides of the firebox. His legs were crossed, and he nursed his knee in a restful embrace. For nearly an hour he sat thus, and only the slow movement of his great rolling eyes, and an occasional inclination of his head, told of the active thought which was passing behind his mask-like features. As he sat there he looked older by half a score of years than either of his companions, but in reality he was a young man. The furrows and hollows upon his face were the marks of privation and exposure, not of age. His bowed figure was not the result of weakness, nor senility. It was chiefly the result of great height and the slouching gait of one who has done much slow tramping. Mr. Zachary Smith made an interesting study as he sat silently beside his stove. His face was the face of an honest man, when his eyes were concealed beneath their heavy lids. It was a good face and refined, tough, vigorous, honest, until the eyelids were raised. Then the expression was utterly changed. 
a something looked out from those great rolling eyeballs which was furtive watchful doubtful they were eyes one sometimes sees in a madman or a great criminal and now as he sat absorbed in his own reflections their gaze alternated between the two brass-bound chests and the recumbent figure of leslie gray so he sat this self-styled zachary smith trapper end of chapter two chapter three of the hound from the north by ridgewell cullum this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by lisa reichert chapter three mr zachary smith smokes it was the third morning of the traveller's sojourn in mr smith's dugout two long idle days had been spent in the fetid atmosphere of the trapper's half-buried house during their enforced stay neither gray nor his subordinates had learnt much of their reticent host it is doubtful if they had troubled themselves much about him he had greeted them with a sort of indifferent hospitality and they were satisfied it was not in the nature of their work to question the characters of those whom they encountered upon their journey to all that he had mr zachary smith had made them welcome they could expect no more and they needed no more now the day had arrived for their departure for the storm had subsided and the sun was shining with all its wintry splendour the three men leisurely devoured an early morning breakfast mr smith was quite cheerful he seemed to be labouring under some strange excitement he looked better too since the advent of his guests perhaps it was the result of the ample supplies of canned provisions which the two men had lavished unsparingly upon him his face was less cadaverous the deep searing furrows were less pronounced altogether there was a marked improvement in this solitary dweller in the wild now he was discussing the prospects of the weather whilst he partook liberally of the food set before him these things aren't like most storms he said they blow themselves out and have done with it they don't come back on you with a change of wind that isn't the way of the blizzard we've got a clear spell of a fortnight and more before us with luck now which way may you be taking gentlemen are you going to head through the mountains for the main trail or are you going to double back on your tracks we are going back said gray with unpleasant emphasis any allusion to his mistake of the road annoyed him chillingwood turned his head away and hid a smile i think you will do well replied the trapper largely i know these hills and i should be inclined to hark back to where you missed the trail i hope to cover twenty miles myself to-day your traps will be buried i should say suggested rob i'm used to that replied the tall man quietly guess i shan't have much difficulty with them he permitted himself the suspicion of a smile gray drew out his pipe and leisurely loaded it rob followed suit mr zachary smith pushed his tin pannikin away from before him and leaned back going to smoke he asked guess i'll join you no not your plug thanks i'm feeling pretty good my weed'll do me you don't fancy to try it t and b's good enough for me said gray with a smile no i won't experiment smith held his pouch towards chillingwood can i rob shook his head with a doubtful smile guess not thanks what's good enough for my chief is good enough for me the trapper slowly unfolded an antelope hide pouch of native workmanship he emptied out a little pile of greenish-brown flakes into the palm of his hand. It was curious, dusty-looking stuff, suggestive of discoloured bran. This he poured into the bowl of a well-worn briar, the mouthpiece of which he carefully and with accuracy adjusted into the corner of his mouth. "'If you ever chance to have the experience I have had in these mountains, gentlemen,' he then went on slowly, as gathering into the palm of his hand a red-hot cinder from the stove, he tossed it to and fro until it lodged on the bowl of his pipe. "'I think you'll find the use of the weed which grows on this hillside,' with a jerk of his head upwards, to indicate the bush which flourished in that direction, "'has its advantages.' "'Maybe,' said Gray contemptuously. "'I doubt it,' said Rob, with a pleasant smile. The lean man knocked the cinder from his pipe and emitted a cloud of pungent smoke from between his lips.' 
the others had lit up but the odour of the trapper's weed quickly dominated the atmosphere he talked rapidly now you folks who travel the main trails don't see much of what is going on in the mountains the real life of the mountains he said you have no conception of the real dangers which these hills contain yes sir they're hidden from the public eye and only get to be known outside by reason of the chance experience of the traveller who happens to lose his way but is lucky enough to escape the pitfalls with which he finds himself surrounded i could tell you some queer yarns of these hills traveller's tales suggested gray with a yawn and a disparaging smile i have heard some yes said rob there are queer tales afloat of adventures encountered by travellers journeying from the valley to the coast but they're chiefly confined to wayside robbery and are of a very sordid everyday kind no doubt your experiences are less matter-of-fact and more romantic by jove i feel jolly comfy not much like turning out that's how it takes me said smith quietly but with a quick glance at the speaker but idleness won't boil my pot it's a remarkable thing that i've felt wonderfully energetic these last few days and now that i have to turn out i should prefer to stop where i am i suppose it's human nature he gazed upon his audience with a broad smile at that moment the loud yelping of the dogs penetrated the thick sides of the dugout rainy moon was preparing for the start doubtless the brilliant change in the weather had inspired the savage burden-bearers of the north that's curious smelling stuff you're smoking said gray rousing himself with an effort after a moment's dead silence what do you call it can't say a weed said zachary smith glancing down his nose towards the bowl of his pipe not bad is it smells of almonds tastes like nutty sherry gray stifled a yawn i feel sleepy damned sleepy wonder if rainy moon has got the sleigh loaded smith emitted another dense cloud of smoke from between his pursed lips he seemed wrapped in the luxurious enjoyment of his smoke rob chillingwood's eyelids were drooping and his pipe had gone out quite suddenly the trapper's eyes were turned on the face of gray and the smoke from his pipe was chiefly directed towards him there's time enough yet he said quietly half an hour more or less won't make much difference to you on the road you were talking of travellers tales and i reckon you were thinking of fairy yarns that some folks think it smart to spin well maybe those same stories have some foundation in fact and ain't all works of imagination anyhow my experience has taught me never to disbelieve until i've some good sound grounds for doing so he paused and gazed with a far-off look at the opposite wall then a shadowy smile stole over his face and he went on his companions heads had drooped slowly forward and their eyes were heavy with sleep gray was fighting against the drowsiness by jerking his head sharply upwards but his eyes would close in spite of his efforts well i never thought that i'd get caught napping continued smith with a chuckle i thought i knew these regions well enough but i didn't i lost my way too and came near to losing my life he broke off abruptly as rob chillingwood slowly rolled over on his side and began to snore loudly then smith turned back to leslie gray and leaning forward so that his face was close to that of the officer blew clouds of the pungent smoke right across the half-stupefied man's mouth and nostrils i lost other things he then went on meditatively but not my life i lost that which was more precious to me i lost gold gold i lost the result of many weary months of toil i had hoarded it up that i might go down to the east and buy a nice little ranch and settle down into a comfortable respectable man of property i didn't even wait until the spring opened so that i could take the river route no that wasn't my way because i knew it would cost a lot of money and i wasn't overburdened with wealth i had just enough he puffed vigorously at his pipe gray's head was now hanging forward and his chin rested on his chest there came the sound of rainy moon's voice adjuring the dogs outside the door of the dugout 
the trapper's eyes flashed evilly in the direction of the unconscious indian to do what i wanted he resumed no more no less and i set out on foot he was anxiously watching for gray's collapse yes i was going to tramp to the sea-coast through these mountains i hit the wrong trail decoyed by a false track carefully made by those who waited for me in these hills gray was swaying heavily and his breathing was stertorous i met my fate and was robbed of my gold i was drugged as you poor fools are being drugged now when it was too late i discovered how it was done and i determined to do the same thing by the first victim that fell into my clutches i tried the weed and soon got used to its fumes then i waited waited i had set my decoy on the crossroads and you you came as the trapper ceased speaking gray slowly rolled over insensible in a moment the watching man was upon his feet his whole face was transfigured alertness was in every movement in every flash of his great eyes he moved quickly across the floor of the hut and took two shallow pannikins from the sack which lay upon the floor dropped some of the flaky weed into the bottom of each one and then from the stove he scraped some coals of fire into them the fire set the dry weed smouldering and the thick smoke rose heavily from the two tins these he placed upon the ground in such a position that his hard-breathing victims should thoroughly inhale the fumes thus he would make doubly sure of them this done he stood erect and gazed for some seconds at the result of his handiwork he was satisfied but there was no look of pleasure on his face he did not look like a man of naturally criminal instincts there was nothing savage about his expression or even callous his look merely seemed to say that he had set himself this task and so far what he had done was satisfactory in view of his object he turned from the heavy slumbering men and his eyes fell upon the two small gold chests instantly his whole expression changed here was the keynote to the man's disposition gold it was the gold he coveted at all costs that gold was to be his his eyes shone with greed he moved towards the boxes as though he were about to handle them but he paused abruptly before he reached them the barking of the dogs and the strident tones of the indian's voice outside arrested him he suddenly remembered that he had not yet completed his work now he moved with unnecessarily stealthy steps over to the darkest corner of the hut to where a pile of rough skins stood the steady nerve which had hitherto served him seemed in a measure to have weakened it was a phase which a man of his disposition must inevitably pass through in the perpetration of a first crime he was assailed by a sensation of watching eyes following his every movement with a feeling that another presence than those two slumbering forms moved with him in the dim light of the dugout he was haunted by his other self the moral self from beneath the pile of furs he drew a heavy revolver which he carefully examined the chambers were loaded again came the sound of the dogs outside and he even fancied he heard the shuffling of rainy moon's moccasins over the beaten snow just outside the door he turned his face in the direction the expression of his great hungry eyes was malevolent whatever moral fear might have been his there could be no doubt that he would carry his purpose out he gripped his pistol firmly and moved towards the door as his hand rested on the latch he paused just for one instant he hesitated it seemed that all that was honest in him was making one final appeal to the evil passions which swayed him his eyelids lowered suddenly as though he could not even face the dim light of the gloomy interior it was the attitude of one who fully realizes the nature of his actions of one who shrinks from the light of honest purpose and prefers the obscure recesses of his own moral darkness then with an effort he pulled himself together he gripped his nerve the next moment he flung wide the door a flood of wintry sunshine suffused the interior of the dugout the glare of the crystal white earth was dazzling to a degree and the hungry-looking trapper stood blinking in the light his pistol was concealed behind him the sleigh was before the door rainy moon stood on the far side of the path in the act of hitching the dogs up one of the animals the largest of them all was already harnessed 
the others were standing or squatting around held in leash by the indian when he heard the door open rainy moon looked up from his work he was standing with his back to the precipice which bordered the narrow ledge his great stolid face expressed nothing but solemn gravity he grunted and turned again to his work like a flash the trapper's pistol darted from behind him and its report rang out echoing and re-echoing amongst the surrounding hills there was an answering cry of pain from the harnessed dog and rainy moon with a yell stood erect to find himself gazing into the muzzle of the revolver the expression of the trapper's face was relentless now his first shot had been fired under the influence of excitement and he had missed his object and only wounded the dog now it was different again the pistol rang out rainy moon gave one sharp cry of pain and sprang backwards into space in one hand he still gripped the leashes of the dogs the other clutched wildly at the air for one instant his fall was broken by his hold upon the four dogs then the suddenness of his precipitation and his weight told and the poor beasts were dragged over the side of the chasm after him the whole dastardly act was but the work of a moment the next all was silent save for the yelping of the wounded dog lying upon the snow the trapper stood for a moment framed in the doorway the horror of his crime was upon him he waited for a sound to come up to him from below he longed to but he dared not look over the side of the yawning chasm he feared what awful sight his eyes might encounter his imagination conjured up pictures that turned him sick in the stomach and a great dread came over him suddenly he turned back into the hut and slammed the door the wounded dog had not changed its attitude the moments sped by suddenly the poor beast began to struggle violently it was a huge specimen of the husky breed exceptionally powerful and wolfish in its appearance the wretched brute moaned incessantly but its pain only made it struggle the harder to free itself from its harness at length it succeeded in wriggling out of the primitive breast draw which held it then the suffering beast limped painfully away down the path fifty yards from the hut it squatted upon its haunches and began to lick its wounded foot and every now and then it would cease its healing operation to throw up its long muzzle and emit one of those drawn-out howls so dismal and dispiriting in which dogs are able to express their melancholy feelings at length the hut door opened again and the trapper came out he was equipped for a long journey thick blanket chaps covered his legs and a great fur coat reached to his knees his head was buried beneath a beaver cap which pressed low down over his ears was overlapped by the collar of his coat he carried a roll of blankets over his shoulder and a pack on his back as he came out into the sunshine he looked fearfully about him there stood the loaded sleigh quite undisturbed the harness alone was tumbled about by reason of the wounded dog's struggles and there was a pool of canine blood upon the snow and a faint trail of sanguinary hue leading from it the man eyed this and followed its direction until he saw the dog crouching down further along the path but he was not thinking of the dog he turned back to the sleigh and his eyes wandered across beyond it to the brink of the precipice the only marks that had disturbed the smooth white edge of the path were those which had tumbled the snow where the dogs had been dragged to their fate otherwise there was no sign the man stepped forward as though to look down to the depths below but as he neared the edge he halted shudderingly nor did his eyes turn downwards he looked around him above him but not down he gazed long and earnestly at the hard cold cloudless sky his brow frowned with unpleasant thought then his lips moved and he muttered words that sounded as though he were endeavouring to justify his acts to himself the gold was mine honestly mine it was wrested from me it may be christian to submit without retaliation it is not human what is a nesh's life nothing pooh an indian life is of no value in this country come on let's go he spoke as though he were not alone perhaps he was addressing that moral self of his which kept reminding him of his misdeeds anyhow he was uncomfortable and his words told of it he stooped and adjusted his snowshoes after which he gripped his long staff and slowly began his journey down the hill he quickly got into his stride 
that forward-leaning attitude of the snowshoer, nor did he glance to the left or right. Straight ahead of him he stared, over the jagged rampart of mountains, to the clear steely hue of the sky above. He was leaving the scene of his crime. He wished also to leave its memory. He gave no heed to the trail of blood that stained the whiteness of the snow beneath his feet. His thoughts were not of the present, his present. His mind was travelling swiftly beyond. The whining of the dog as he passed him fell upon ears that were deaf to all entreaty. The crystal-covered earth glided by him. The long, reaching stride of the expert snowshoer bore him rapidly along. He paused in the valley below and took fresh bearings. He intended to strike through the heart of the mountains. The pass was his goal, for he knew that there lay the main trail he sought. He cast about for the landmarks which he had located during his long tenancy of the dugout. Not a branch of a tree rustled. Not a breath of air fanned the steaming breath which poured from his lips. His mind was centred on his object, but the nervous realisation of loneliness was upon him. Suddenly the awful stillness was broken. The man bent his head in a listening attitude. The sound came from behind, and he turned sharply. His movement was hurried and anxious. His nerves were not steady. A long, drawn-out wail rose upon the air. Fifty yards behind stood the wounded hound, gazing after him as if he, too, were endeavouring to ascertain the right direction. The creature was standing upon three legs. The fourth was hanging useless, and the blood was dripping from the footless limb. The man turned away with an impatient shrug and stepped out briskly. He knew his direction now, and resolutely centred his thoughts upon his journey. Past experience told him that this would tax all his energy and endurance, and that he must keep a clear head, for he was not a native of the country, nor had he the instinct of one whose life had been passed in a mountainous world. Once he turned at the sound of a plaintive whining, and to his annoyance he saw that the dog was following him. A half-nervous laugh escaped him, but he did not pause. He had hitherto forgotten the creature, and this was an unpleasant reminder. An hour passed. The exhilarating exercise had cleansed the atmosphere of the murderer's thoughts. Once only he looked back over his shoulder, as some memory of the dog flashed across his brain. He could see nothing but the immaculate gleam of snow. Something of the purity of his surroundings seemed to communicate itself to his thoughts. He found himself looking forward to a life, the honest, respectable life, which the burden he carried in his pack would purchase for him. He saw himself the owner of vast tracts of pasture, with stock grazing upon it, a small but comfortable house, and a wife. He pictured to himself the joys of a pastoral life, a community in which his opinions and influence would be matters of importance. He would be looked up to, and gradually, as his wealth grew, he would become interested in the world of politics, and he would— he was dragged back to the present by a memory of the scene at the dugout, and quite suddenly he broke into a cold perspiration. He increased his pace, nor did those pleasant visions again return to him. It was well past noon when at last he halted for food and rest. He devoured his simple fare ravenously, but he gained no enjoyment therefrom. He was moody. At that moment he hated life, he hated himself for his weak yielding to the pricks of conscience. He hated the snow and ice about him for their deadening effect upon the world through which he was passing. He hated the dreadful solitude with which he was surrounded. Presently he drew out a pipe. He looked at it for one instant, then raised it to his nose. He smelt it, and with a motion of disgust and a bitter curse, he threw it from him. It reeked of the weed he had found at the dugout. Now he was seized with a feverish restlessness and was about to rise to his feet. Suddenly, out on the still, biting air, wailed the familiar, long-drawn note of misery. To his disturbed fancy it came like a dreadful signal of some awful doom. It echoed in undulating waves of sound, dying away hardly as though it were loath to leave its mournful surroundings. He turned in the direction whence it proceeded, and slowly into view, limped the wounded husky, yelping piteously at every step. At that moment the man was scarcely responsible for what he did. 
He was beside himself with dread. The solitude was on his nerves. This haunting dog, his own reflections, all had combined to reduce him to the verge of nervous prostration. With the last dying sound, his heavy revolver was levelled in the direction of the oncoming hound. There was a moment's pause, then a shot rang out, and the dog stood quite still. The bullet fell short and only kicked up the snow some yards in front of the animal, nor did the beast display the least sign of fear. The man prepared to take another shot, but, as he was about to fire, his arm dropped to his side, and with a mirthless laugh, he put the pistol away. "'The damned cur seems to know the range of a gun,' he muttered, with an uneasy look at the motionless creature. The words were an apology to himself, although perhaps he would not have admitted it. The dog remained in its rigid attitude, its head was slightly lowered, and its wicked grey eyes glared ferociously. Its thick mane bristled, and it looked like a gaunt, hungry wolf, following upon the trail of some unconscious traveller. So long as the man stood, so long did the dog remain still and silent. But as the former returned to his seat and began to pack up, the dog began to whine and furtively draw nearer. Although he did not look up, the man knew that the animal was coming towards him. When he had finished packing, he straightened himself. The dog was within a few paces of him. He called gently, and the animal responded with a whimper, but remained where it was. Its canine mind was evidently dubious, and the man was forced to take the initiative. Whatever may have been his intention in the first place, he now exhibited a curious display of feeling, for one who could plan and perpetrate so dastardly a crime as that which he had committed at the dugout. Human nature is a strange blending of good and evil passions. Two minutes ago the man would, without the least remorse, have shot the dog, now, as he reached him, and as he listened to the beast's plaintive cries, he stretched out his arm and stroked its trembling sides, and then stooped to examine the wounded limb. And, stranger still, he tore off a portion of the woollen scarf that circled his waist, and proceeded to bandage up the shattered member. The dog submitted to the operation with languid resignation. The foot of one hind leg had been entirely torn away by a revolver shot, and only the stump of the leg was left. The poor beast would go on three legs for the rest of his life. When the man had finished he rose to his feet, and a bitter laugh shocked the silence of the snowbound world. "'There, you miserable cur! It's better like that than to get the cold into it. I've had some. Besides, I didn't intend to damage you. If you're going to travel with me, you'd best come along and be damned to you.' and he walked back to where his pack and blankets lay, and the dog limped at his heels. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter 4 Yellow Booming, Slump in Grey the days are long since gone when the name of the Midland Territory of the great Canadian world, Manitoba, suggested to the uninitiated nothing but Red Indians, Buffalo, and Desperados of every sort and condition. Nowadays it is well known, even in remote parts of the world, as one of the earth's greatest granaries, a land of rolling pastures, golden cornfields, and prosperous simple farm folk. In a short space of time, little more than a quarter of a century, this section of the country has been elevated from the profound obscurity of a lawless wilderness to one of the most thriving provinces of a great dominion. The old Fort Garry, one of the oldest factories of the Hudson's Bay Company, has given place to the magnificent city of Winnipeg, with its own university, its own governing assembly, its own clubs, hotels, its own world-wide commercial interests, besides being the great centre of railway traffic in the country. All these things, and many other indications of splendid prosperity too numerous to mention, have grown up in a little over twenty-five years. And with this growth, the buffalo has gone, the red man has been herded on to a limited reservation, and the bad man is almost an unknown quantity. Such is the Manitoba of today.' 
but during the stages of manitoba's transition its history is interesting the fight between law and lawlessness was long and arduous the pitched battles many and frequent buffalo could be killed off quickly the red man was but a poor thing after the collapse of the riel rebellion but the bad man died hard this is the period in the history of manitoba which at present interests us when winnipeg was building with a rapidity almost rivalling that of the second chicago and the army of older farmers in the land was being hastily augmented by recruits from the mother country when the military police had withdrawn their forces to the northwest territories leaving only detachments to hold the american border against the desperadoes which both countries were equally anxious to be rid of in the remote southeastern corner of the province forty-five miles from the nearest town which happened to be the village of ainsley dumped down on the crest of a far-reaching ocean-like swell of rolling prairie bare to the blast of the four winds except for the insignificant shelter of a small bluff on its northeastern side stood a large farmhouse surrounded by a small village of barns and outbuildings it was a typical canadian farm of the older western type one of those places which had grown by degrees from the one central hut of logs clay and thatch to the more pretentious proportions of the modern frame building of red pine weatherboarding with shingled roofing to match and the whole coloured with paint of a deep port wine hue the points and angles being picked out with a dazzling white it was a farm let there be no mistake and not merely a homestead there were abundant signs of prosperity in the trim well-groomed appearance of the place the unmistakable hallmark was to be found in the presence of a steam thresher buried beneath a covering of tarpaulin and snow in the array of farming machinery and in the maze of pastures enclosed by top-railed barbed wire fencing all these things and the extent of the buildings told of years of ceaseless industry and thrift of able management and a proper pride in the vocation of its owner nor were these outward signs in any way misleading silas mauling in his lifetime had been one of those sound-minded men unimaginative and practical the dominant note of whose creed had always been to do his duty in that state of life in which he found himself the son of an early pioneer he had been born to the life of a farmer and having the good fortune to follow in the footsteps of a thrifty father he had lived long enough to see his farm grow to an extent many times larger and more prosperous than that of any neighbour within a radius of a hundred miles but at the time of our story he had been gathered to his forefathers for nearly three years and his worthy spouse hepzibah malling reigned in his stead she ruled with an equally practical hand and fortune had continued to smile upon her her bank balance had grown by leaps and bounds and she was known to be one of the richest women in southern manitoba and her only daughter prudence to be heiress to no inconsiderable fortune there was a son in the family but he had eschewed the farm life and passing out of the home circle as some sons will had gone into the world to seek his own way his own experiences of life in spite of the wealth of the owners of loon dyke farm they were very simple unpretentious folk they lived the life they had always known abiding by the customs of childhood and the country to which they belonged with the whole-hearted regard which is now becoming so regrettably rare their world was a wholesome one which provided them with all they needed for thought labour and recreation to journey to winnipeg a distance of a hundred and twenty-six miles was an event which required two days preparation and as many weeks of consideration ainsley one of those little border villages which dot the international boundary dividing canada from the united states was a place rarely visited by them and when undertaken the trip was regarded as a notable jaunt just now mrs malling was a prey to the wildest excitement an event was about to happen which disturbed her to a degree it is doubtful as to what feeling was uppermost in her motherly bosom she was torn between many conflicting emotions joy grief pleasurable excitement her daughter her only child as she was wont to confide to her matronly friends for her boy whom she loved as only a mother can love a son she believed she would never see again was about to be married 
no visit to town not even a sea voyage across the ocean could possibly compare with this it was a more significant event in her life even than when she went into winnipeg to choose the monument which was to be erected over the grave of her dear departed silas that she had always had in her mind's eye not because she looked forward to his demise but because she hoped some day to share with him its sheltering canopy but somehow this forthcoming marriage of her daughter was in the nature of a shock to her she was not mercenary far from it she was above any such motive as that but she had hoped when the time came for such matters to be considered that prudence would have married a certain rancher who lived out by the lake of the woods a man of great wealth and a man whom mrs malling considered desirable in every way instead of that prudence had chosen for herself amongst her many suitors and worst of all she had chosen an insignificant official in the customs department that to hepzibah malling was the worst blow of all with proper motherly pride she had hoped that her girl would have married a someone in her own world the winter evening shadows it was the middle of january and winter still held sway upon the prairie were falling and the parlour at the farm was enveloped in a grey dusk the room was large low-ceilinged and of irregular shape it was furnished to serve many purposes principally with a view to solid comfort there was no blatant display of wealth and every article of furniture bore signs of long though careful use the spotless boarded floor was bare of carpet but was strewn with rough cured skins timber wolf antelope coyote and bear and here and there rugs of undoubted home make these latter of the patchwork order the centre table was of wide proportions and of solid mahogany and told of the many services of the apartment the small chairs were old-fashioned mahogany pieces with horsehair seats while the easy chairs and there were several of these were capacious and of diverse descriptions a well-worn sofa was stowed away in an obscure angle and a piano with a rose silk front and fretwork occupied another of the many dark corners which the room possessed the whole atmosphere of the place was of extreme comfort the bare description of furniture conveys nothing but the comfort was there and showed out in the odds and ends of family possessions which were in evidence everywhere the grandfather's clock the sewing machine the quaint old oil lamps upon the mantelboard over the place where the fire should have been but was not the soft hangings and curious old family pictures and discoloured engravings the perfect femininity of the room in all respects it was a canadian farm best parlour there were four occupants of the room two old ladies rotund and garbed in modest raiment of some sort of dark clinging material were gathered about the monster self-feeding stove seated in armchairs in keeping with their ample proportions one was the widow of the late silas malling and the other was the school ma'am from the leonville schoolhouse this good lady rejoiced in the name of gurridge and mrs gurridge was the oldest friend of hepzibah malling a fact which spoke highly for the former good dame's many excellent qualities hepzibah was not a woman to set her affections on her sex without good reason her moral standard was high and though she was ever ready to show kindliness to her fellow-creatures she was far too practical and honest herself to take to her motherly bosom any one who was not worthy of regard as was natural they were talking of the forthcoming marriage and the tone of their lowered voices indicated that their remarks were in the nature of confidences mrs malling was sitting bolt upright and her plump rather rough hands were folded in her broad lap mrs gurridge was leaning towards the stove gazing into the fire through the mica sides of the fire-box i trust they will be happy said mrs gurridge with a sigh then as an afterthought he seems all right yes mrs malling said with a responsive exhalation i think so he has few faults but he is not the man to follow my silas on this farm i truly believe sarah that he couldn't tell the difference between a cabbage field and a potato patch these what do you call em's civil servants are only fit to tot up figures and play around with a woman's wardrobe every time she crosses the border thank goodness i'm not of the travelling kind i'm sure i should hide my face for very shame every time i saw a customs officer 
the round rosy face of the farm-wife assumed a deeper hue and her still comely lips were pursed into an indignant moue her smooth grey head adorned by a black lace cap trimmed with pearl beads was turned in the direction of the two other occupants of the room who were more or less buried in the obscurity of a distant corner for a moment she gazed at the dimly outlined figure of a man who was seated on one of the horsehair chairs leaning towards the sofa on which reclined the form of her daughter prudence his elbows were resting on his knees and his chin was supported upon his two clenched fists he was talking earnestly mrs malling watched him for some moments then her eyes drifted to the girl the object of her solicitude although the latter was in the shadow her features were even at this distance plainly discernible there was a strong resemblance between mother and daughter they were both of medium dark complexion with strong colouring both were possessed of delightfully sweet brown eyes and mouths and chins firm but shapely the one remarkable difference between them was in the nasal organ while the mother's was short well-rounded and what one would call pretty though ordinary the girl's was prominent and aquiline with a decided bridge this feature gave the younger woman a remarkable amount of character to her face altogether hers was a face which wherever she went would inevitably attract admiring attention just now she was evidently teasing the man before her and the mother turned back to the stove with a merry twinkle in her eyes i think prudence will teach him a few lessons she murmured to her friend what about the farm well i wasn't just thinking of the farm the two ladies smiled into each other's faces she is a good child observed mrs gurridge affectionately after a while or she wouldn't be her father's child or your daughter hepzibah said sarah gurridge sincerely the two relapsed into silence the glowing coals in the stove shook lower and received augmentation from the supply above darkness was drawing on prudence was holding the free press out towards the dying light and the man was protesting the latter is already known to us his name was leslie gray now an under official of the customs department at the border village of ainsley don't strain your eyes in this light dear he was saying besides i want to talk to you he laid his hand over the paper to take it from her but the girl quickly withdrew it out of his reach you must let me look at the personal column leslie she said teasingly i just love it what do you call it the agony column isn't it yes the man answered with some show of irritation but i want of course you do the girl interrupted you want to talk to me very right and proper but listen to this grey bit his lip prudence bent her face close to the paper and read in a solemn whisper yellow booming slump in grey now i wonder what that means do you think it's a disguised love message to some forlorn damsel in the east or does it conceal the heart-rending cry of a lost soul to some fond but angry parent then as the man did not immediately answer she went on with a pucker of thought upon her brow yellow that might mean gold booming ah yes the kootenay mines or the yukon there is going to be a rush there this year isn't there oh i forgot with real contrition i mustn't mention the yukon must i that is where your disaster occurred that caused you to be banished to the one-horsed station of ainsley not forgetting the reduction of my salary to the princely sum of two thousand dollars per annum grey added bitterly never mind old boy it brought us together and dollars aren't likely to trouble us any but let me get on with my puzzle slump in grey that's funny isn't it slump certainly has to do with business i've seen slump in the finance columns of the toronto globe and then gray that's your name i believe so um i guess i can't make much of it seems to me it must be some business message i call it real disappointing perhaps not so disappointing as you think sweetheart gray said thoughtfully what do you understand it the girl at once became all interest yes slowly i understand it but i don't know that i ought to tell you of course you must i'm just dying of curiosity besides she went on coaxingly 
we are going to be married and it wouldn't be right to have any secrets from me dear old gurridge never lost an opportunity of firing sage maxims at us when i used to go to her school i think the one to suit this occasion ran something like this secrets withheld twixt man and wife infallibly end in connubial strife she always made her rhymes up as she went along she's a sweet old dear but so funny but Gray was not heeding the girl's chatter his face was serious and his obstinate mouth was tight shut he was gazing with introspective eyes at the paper which was now lying in the girl's lap suddenly he leaned further forward and spoke almost in a whisper look here prue i want you to listen seriously to what i have to say i'm not a man given to undue hopefulness i generally take my own way in things and see it through whether that way is right or wrong so far i've had some successes and more failures if i were given to dreaming or repining i should say fate was dead against me that last smasher i came in the mountains when i lost the government bullion nearly settled me altogether but in spite of it all i haven't given up hope yet and what is more i anticipate making a big coup shortly which will reinstate me in favour with the heads of my department my coup is in connection with the notice you have just read out from the agony column the girl nodded she was quite serious now grey paused and the ticking of the grandfather's clock on the other side of the room pounded heavily in the twilight the murmur of the old lady's voices occasionally reached the lovers but it did not interrupt them or divert their attention from their own affairs that notice grey went on has appeared at regular intervals in the paper and is a message to certain agents from a certain man to say that certain illicit work has been carried out i have discovered who this man is and the nature of his work it does not matter who he is or what the work in fact it would be dangerous to mention either even here the point is that i have discovered the secret and i alone am going to benefit by my discovery i am not going to let any one share the reward with me i want to reinstate myself with the authorities and so regain my lost position then no one will be able to say things about my marriage with you no one had better say anything against you in my hearing anyway leslie the girl put in quickly because i happen to be rich or shall be is nothing to do with any one but myself as far as i can see it will be a blessing go on no doubt it is as you say dear the man pursued but there are plenty of people unkind enough to believe that i am marrying you for your money however i am going to get this man red-handed and i tell you it'll be the greatest coup of my life i hope you will succeed leslie the girl said her brown eyes fixed in admiration upon her lover do you know i never thought you were such a determined fellow she added impulsively why i can almost believe that you'd learn to farm if you took the notion grey's sense of humour was not equal to the occasion and he took a remark quite seriously a man must be a fool if he can't run a farm he said roughly many folks labour under that mistake the girl replied then say when are you going to do this thing strangely enough the critical moment will come two days after our marriage let's see this is monday we are to be married to-morrow week that will make it thursday week the girl sat herself up on the sofa and her young face expressed dismay right in the middle of our honeymoon oh leslie it can't be helped dearest i shall only be away from you for that afternoon and the night think of what it means to me everything ah yes she sank back again upon the sofa there was the faintest glimmer of a smile in the depths of her dark eyes i forgot what it meant to you the unconscious irony of her words fell upon stony ground prudence malling was deeply in love with leslie gray how few men fully appreciate the priceless treasure of a good woman's regard if i bring this off it means immediate promotion gray went on in his blindly selfish way i must succeed i hate failure they will take you off the border then said the girl musingly that will mean leaving here which also means a big step up of course it will mean a big step up 
the girl sighed she loved the farm that home which she had always known she changed the subject suddenly it must be nearly tea-time we are going to have tea early leslie so that we can get through it comfortably before the people come oh yes i forgot you are having a progressive euchre party to-night what time does it begin i mean the party seven o'clock but you are going to stay to tea gray glanced up at the yellow face of the grandfather's clock and shook his head afraid not little girl i've got some work to do in connection with thursday week i will drop in about nine o'clock who are coming is it really necessary this work there was a touch of bitterness in prudence's voice but the next moment she went on cheerfully she would not allow herself to stand in her lover's way the usual people are coming it will be just our monthly gathering of neighbouring mossbacks with a laugh the turners the furrers peter furrers of course he still hopes to cut you out and the girls old glyken and his two sons harry and tim and the ganthorns from rosebank and their cousins the covels of lakeville and i almost forgot him mother's flame george iredale of lonely ranch is iredale coming it's too bad of you to have him here prue your mother's flame mm, i don't like that why he's been after you for over three years it's not right to ask him when i am here besides gray broke off abruptly darkness hid the angry flush which had spread over his face the girl knew he was angry his tone was raised and there was no mistaking leslie gray's anger he was very nearly a gentleman but not quite i think i have a perfect right to ask him leslie she answered seriously his coming can make no possible difference to you frankly i like him but that makes no difference to my love for you why you dear silly thing if he asked me from now till doomsday i wouldn't marry him he's just a real good friend but still if it will please you i don't mind admitting that mother insisted on his coming and that i had nothing to do with it that is why i call him mother's flame now then take that ugly frown off your face and say you're sorry gray showed no sign of obedience he was very angry it was believed and put about by the busybodies of the district that george iredale had sought prudence mauling in marriage ever since she had grown up he was a bachelor of close upon forty one of those quiet determined men slow of speech even clumsy but quick to make up their minds and endowed with a great tenacity of purpose a man who rarely said he was going to do a thing but generally did it these known features in a man who up to the time of the announcement of prudence's engagement to gray had been a frequent visitor to the farm and who was also well known to be wealthy and more than approved of by mrs mauling no doubt gave a certain amount of colour to the belief of those who chose to pry into their neighbours affairs anyway i don't think there is room for both iredale and myself in the house gray went on heatedly if you didn't want him you should have put your foot down on your mother's suggestion i don't think i shall come to-night for one moment the girl looked squarely into her lover's face and her pretty lips drew sharply together then she spoke quite coldly you will or i'll never speak to you again you are very foolish to make such a fuss there was a long silence between the lovers then gray drew out his watch opened it glanced at the time and snapped it closed again i must go he said shortly prudence had risen from the sofa she no longer seemed to heed her lover she was looking across the darkened room at the homely picture round the glowing stove very well she said and she moved away from the man's side the two old ladies, pausing in their conversation, heard Gray's announcement and the answer Prudence made. Sarah Gurridge leaned towards her companion with a confidential movement of the head. The two grey heads came close together. The school ma'am whispered impressively, Maid who angers faithful swain will shed more tears and no more pain than she who loves and loves in vain. Hepzibah laughed tolerantly. Sarah's earnestness never failed to amuse her my dear the girl's mother murmured back when her comfortable laugh had gurgled itself out young folks must skit-skat and bicker or where would be the making up la i'm sure when i was a girl i used to tweak my poor silas's nose for the love of making him angry 
silas had a long nose my dear as you may remember men hate to be tweaked especially on their weak points my silas was always silly about his nose and we never had less than half an hour's making up i wonder how prudence has tweaked mr gray i can't bring myself to call him leslie my dear prudence had reached her mother's side the two old heads parted with guilty suddenness oh my dear exclaimed mrs malling how you did startle me i'm sorry mother the girl said but i wanted to tell you that leslie is not coming to-night prudence turned a mischievous face towards her lover mrs malling wrinkled up her smooth forehead she assumed an air of surprise why not my child oh because you have asked mr iredale leslie says it isn't right prudence was still looking in her lover's direction he had his back turned he was more angry now than ever my dears said her mother with an indulgent smile you are a pair of silly noodles but mr gray i mean leslie must please himself george iredale is coming because i have asked him this house is yours to come and go to as you like er leslie george iredale has promised to come to the cards to-night did i hear you say you were going now i should have taken it homely if you would have stayed to tea the party begins at seven don't forget three pairs of quizzical eyes were fixed upon gray's good-looking but angry face his anger was against prudence entirely now she had made him look foolish before these two ladies and that was not easily to be forgiven gray's lack of humour made him view things in a ponderous light he felt most uncomfortable under the laughing gaze of those three ladies however he would not give way an inch yes i must go now he said ungraciously but not on account of george iredale he added blunderingly i have some important work to do he was interrupted by a suppressed laugh from prudence he turned upon her suddenly glared then walked abruptly to the door good-bye he exclaimed shortly and the door closed sharply behind him why prudence said mrs malling turning her round laughing face to her daughter and indicating the door aren't you no i'm not mother dear the girl answered with a forced laugh sarah gurridge patted her late pupil's shoulder affectionately but her head shook gravely as though a weight of worldly wisdom was hers i don't think he'll stay away said the mother with a tender glance in the girl's direction he hasn't chin enough said sarah who prided herself upon her understanding of physiognomy indeed he has retorted prudence who heard the remark mrs malling was right leslie gray was not going to stay away he had no intention of doing so but his reasons were quite apart from those hepzibah malling attributed to him he wished to see george iredale and because of the man's coming gray would forgo his angry desire to retaliate upon prudence he quite ignored what he was pleased to call his own pride in the matter he would come because he had what he considered excellent reasons for doing so prudence lit the lamps and laid the table for tea her mother ambled off to the great kitchen as fast as her bulk would allow her there were many things in that wonderful place to see to for the supper and on these occasions mrs malling would not trust their supervision even to prudence much less to the hired girl mary sarah gurridge remained in her seat by the stove watching the glowing coals dreamily her mind galloping ahead through fanciful scenes of her own imagination had she been asked she would probably have stated that she was looking forward into the future of the pair who were soon to be married prudence went on quietly and nimbly with her work presently sarah turned and after a moment's intent gaze at the trim rounded figure said in her profoundest tone harvest your wheat ere the august frost one breath of cold and the crop is lost oh bother there i've set a place for leslie exclaimed prudence in a tone of vexation what is that about frost and lost nothing dear i was only thinking aloud said sarah gurridge and sarah gurridge relapsed into silence and continued to bask in the warm glow of the stove End of chapter 4